Mr. Diesel wears this knitted almost Playmobil helmet thingy <laughs> going on and it is it is awesome. Hello, welcome to Pod Hard. No, you can't say it like that. You gotta say it like this. Well, hello and welcome to Pod Hard. <laughs> why, why the hell? We're two hard Do... guys looking for <laughs> some hard movies. Yeah, hard currency. We want those movies to be hard packing. Hard, 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 hard. Uh, hello, yeah. everybody. My name is Jonas Högberg. And this is Anders Schultqvist. Yes, what a boom! Should I talk voice. like this all the time? Uh, I would rather if you didn't. That would uh, <laughs> that would throw me off, I think. Yeah, I think it will throw me off as well. But but I'm already uh, thrown off. And I gotta say, we jumped ahead to skip back. I gotta uh, confess, uh, we we were supposed to skip 1929. It seemed like a drag. So we were already recorded in 1930, but that movie was so uh, not intense that I was thinking, uh, damn, what the hell? We go back to 1929 to cover every year. How bad can it be? Can it really be worse? But then it hit me. It could be worse because the 1930 movie had some fabulous action. Uh, This one could uh, be missing even that. Yeah, so the movie we're talking about this episode, it's uh, The White Hell of Pitzpalu, a German mountain climbing movie that... uh, Yeah, they did a lot of those, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, it was like a mountain climbing craze in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, I mean, uh, Quentin Tarantino referenced this in Inglourious Bastards, uh, where this movie is uh, referenced uh, quite a bit. Uh, So that would be interesting. Uh, one of the characters uh, in that movie, Inglorious Bastards, um, played by Fassbender, uh, Archie Hickox, the Englishman, uh, joining the Bastards uh, for this um, mission in the beer hall. Uh, he tells some Germans that he actually was an extra in this movie. Uh, that is his cover. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we'll see if we can uh, spot Fassbender in this movie, Anders. <laughs> okay, I didn't know. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a while since I saw Inglourious Bastards. So maybe w- I should have rewatched it. Uh, yeah. B- uh, for watching this. For watching this, yeah, definitely. I, I-, I saw that. Uh, Bad is, research, uh, Anders. Bad research. That's my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that this movie is. Um, showing at the cinema in Inglourious Bastards, but she, yeah. uh, the lead character tears it down and puts up a poster for a Max Linder festival. Well, I, I so. think they were having... Uh, I think she was having... Uh, I mean, the, the lead character in Inglourious Bastards' own uh, cinema, a movie theater, and she has uh, she's being forced, since she's based in France during the occupation... Uh, she's forced to show uh, German movies, but uh, this movie is one of the few movies that she can actually put up. And uh, since it's since it's an old German movie and not just doing the uh, Nazi propaganda thing, uh, she she has some respect for this movie. So they talk a lot about the, the director for this movie, uh, G. W. Pabst. Um, but he's actually uh, one of two directors for this movie. So uh, Pabst does all of the, I think it's all of the indoor sequences. Um, and Arnold Fank does all of the uh, fantastic uh, mountain climbing scenes. The um, fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he did a lot of these uh, mountain climbing movies. Um so, yeah, and uh, we should probably mention that uh, the star of the movie is Lenny Riefenstahl, Anders. Yeah, Nazi. <laughs> yeah, Nazi. Yeah, 
the woman who would later direct the, um, the Triumph of the Will, one of the most notorious uh, movies that uh, was uh, used for propaganda um, during the Nazi regime. Yeah, I sh- suppose she's uh, really important for, uh, I mean, uh, exploring this uh, f- fascist uh, imagery. Yeah, that that we that we still use today in in uh, American mm. Hollywood uh, blockbuster cinema and such. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely an important character in the history of movies, for sure. Uh, But here she's only an actress. Um, So, yeah, Uh, this will be truly uh, interesting. Uh, Let's just hope there's a lot of um, ravines that need to be trespassed. Trespassed. Uh, need to be <laughs> jumped over. <laughs> they filmed um, a real one that that almost uh, killed them all, didn't they? Yeah, and, and we should uh, note that we haven't seen the movie yet. Now we're actually doing one uh, of these, yeah. uh, these uh, pre-talks that we did a lot uh, when we did the podcast in Swedish. So we're, we're piece by piece, we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying to retrace our steps and go back in the same style that we used to go for in uh, Swedish. Yeah, um, so we've gone from retracing action history to retracing pod hard <laughs> s- structure. <laughs> yeah, that that this will be truly interesting. So, so yeah. So this is basically the the original cliffhanger. Does that uh, make you uh, pump your fists or uh, in anticipation or in anger? <laughs> in anger and you know that. We we, <laughs> yeah. uh, we did the cliffhanger <laughs> when we did the, the pod in Swedish and uh, we were so disappointed. It was Let's uh, just say we're no um, René Harlin fans. Oh uh, man, what a bore that movie was. Uh, but I guess it wasn't really the, the climbing scenes that were the worst <laughs> in that movie. So uh, let, let's... Yeah, ju- so maybe we should just jump in and climb up the hill. Let's do it. Here we come. The White Hell of Pitts Palu. And we're back, everybody. Uh, yeah, we've endured our my first uh, berg film, filme. Yeah, berg filme. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, was uh, two hours and fourteen minutes of my life that I won't get back. Uh, and I'm, I'm a bit disappointed, and not only because I didn't see uh, Fassbender, uh, his cameo in the movie, um, because this was, uh, well, it was a very beautiful movie that had nothing going on. That's my summary. <laughs> so yeah, we can move on. So our episode um, is over. The movie is a. B- <laughs> I mean, the white hell of Pitts Palo. There's this dude in close ups who loses his wife in a. She falls down a ravine. And I gotta say, the dolls in this one are great. We get some doll action. But we'll return to that in a bit. Yeah, it's not like uh, Monty Python uh, dolls where they're throwing uh, these very loose dolls out of uh, windows. These dolls are very rigid and very uh, human body-like. So it looks really awesome when they're being uh, thrown down ravines and uh, bouncing into uh, rock walls. Okay, and stuff so like we that. got to the dolls uh, directly then. Well, there is a doll in the I beginning mean, the slop- of the movie. The sloppy dolls uh, are... The sloppy dolls? <laughs> the flappy <laughs> dolls. The flappy yeah. sloppy dolls. From, fr- so yeah, you had uh, Anders uh, a theme, a sexual suggestion. Theme yeah, I'm that co- <laughs> you were yeah, I'm getting present. back to that. But uh, I was thinking about the. Uh, uh, it was reminding me of the 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 dolls from <laughs> the night in O's. The O's, the uh, really early doll work that we have uh, seen. I, there's still something fascinating. I think we should bring back dolls. Dolls looks... are great, man. We don't need any uh, no, CGI. It's, it looks so vicious when they are so uh, lifeless and uh, gets thrown. Uh, if you just can yeah. Um, uh, yeah, get into it, I suppose. 
I mean, you need to do uh, dolls with the same physicality of a real human body, of course, and the same weight. I think that's very important. Uh, but yeah, so uh, we're gonna give uh, full props f- to this movie for using the best dolls <laughs> in a couple of seconds. In a <laughs> yeah, I mean the action moments uh, in this movie is. Uh, I think we can narrow it down to like um, five seconds in the beginning, and then ten seconds at the halfway mark. I think. So yeah, that's about it, guys. <laughs> Yeah, but it's uh, quick and uh, vicious and uh, abruptly changes <laughs> the movie's pace, which is ad- at other places are l- very languid. Yeah, and very nicely edited. I mean, the editing is uh, ooh, on par uh, in the doll action uh, things. If, so the tagline is something like, if you're in for sharp doll action, you get 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> of it. This guy is mourning uh, to dripping ice, which will give him uh, some kind of trauma. He, he can't handle dripping ice fr- from this point on. And he's also fading away in the mountain. Did you notice that? So, so I guess you never leave this place in a way. Yeah, you get to be one with the mountain. And there's a lot of suggestive icicles uh, throughout this movie. And it's a really dirty movie, so, so here I go. I mean, there are uh, icicles uh, dripping suggestively in uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's face. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and her fiancé, this uh, dude, uh, short pants... <laughs> we call him short pants because he has short pants. Yeah. Uh, he plays a dog and uh, throws snow in her face. Yeah. And there are always these close-ups of Lenny Riefenstahl uh, when she gets... Uh, when wet. she gets stuffs in her face. When she gets stuffs in her face. And she's like, mm, pretty good stuff uh, <laughs> in, in my, my face. face. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they're living large in the mountain, uh, popping champagne bottles, having a gay old time, frolicking yeah. about, all that stuff. Yeah, and, and this goes on for quite some time. And short pa- pants, uh, I, I mean, uh, he's very naive and uh, boy like, although he does get down with a very uh, upfront crotch shot in bed. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true, so, true. well, uh, they live here, and uh, can anything go wrong? And Lenny Riefenstahl says, the ice does seem foreboding. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, in, in an inter- In what way? In an intertext. Hmm. So, the man from the beginning shows up, and Riefenstahl can't take her eyes off him. Yeah, he's a magnetic... And you, you had a, you were, you were, you were like um, steaming through your library of actors' faces, uh, trying to find a match for this person. Yeah, because it was you were so like, many. Who this? This <laughs> yeah, yeah. This person is so many faces. He's Julian Sands from Warlock. Yeah, at first he was a Swedish comedian, and yeah, you <laughs> Andrea <laughs> Borg. And then it was Julian Sands. Then it's Julian Sands. And at the ending, he's Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, at the very end. But before that, he is this... Uh, do you m- remember... Uh, oh, what is 24 Timas Jakten in English? It's um, Inner Space. So in Inner Space, there's this character. Uh, he's a cowboy kind of dude. And uh, Martin Short is copying him. And uh, yeah, he looks like that character as well. Okay. And, Bren- and some Brendan Fraser. Good jawline on this guy. He has a lot going for him. He's um, got a lot going for him. Maybe we should uh, tell the people what this actor's name is. He's acting a lot, though. A bit too much for my taste. So, anyway, Riefenstahl, she can't chop up her tiny piece of uh, peckerwood to put in the fire. <laughs> so, <laughs> this guy's... Excuse me? <laughs> uh, I mean, Gustav the... Diesel... Uh, you're talking about... Is he called Gustav Diesel? <laughs> His name is Gustav Diesel. So he's pretty cool. I mean... <laughs> and he, he plays uh, Dr. Johannes Kraft. 
I tried to put forth uh, that he looked pretty good in close-ups, but I was shut down immediately by Jonas. So he was not up to Leo Nepar as I understand it. Yeah, there's a lot of close-ups in the beginning of the movie, and we immediately thought of a Charlie Chaplin quote, uh, which he said about, uh, you know, life is a tragedy when seen in close-up, but a comedy in long shot. Uh, or full shot so yeah uh, we got a tragedy on our hands here for sure uh, because we get a lot of brooding faces <laughs> you wanted more facial uh, but hair they're clean shaved faces that's not how I like my faces Yeah, I want them sweaty and beardy and uh, full of uh, this um, uh, they need to be very weary and you know you need to see the cracks in their in their faces as well. Yeah, cracks are good, but I think his distinguished. Uh, <laughs> okay, you're resoning <laughs> out there <laughs> to yeah. men's facial hair again. Uh, I I think his uh, very distinguished jawline would be somewhat obscured by uh, a beard. Yeah, true that. Um, so anyway, this guy comes into this. Um, they're having like a honeymoon, short pants and uh, Lenny Riefenstahl. And uh, when uh, uh, Dr. Johannes <laughs> comes uh, to the party, uh, he I don't, I don't really know why they invite them there, him there. If Is he invited? It, see, it, see, it seems like they have this cabin and he just appears and goes in and joins their party like... You know, they ask, would you like some tea? And he's like, yeah, I can use some tea. And then he sort of moves in and (laughs) wanders around brooding, smoking his pipe. Yeah, he mulls around with his pipe for for, uh, several minutes. Yeah, there's a a sequence where he's walking outside of the house, smoking his pipe uh, that goes on for like too long and we <laughs> and we cross cut to uh this other guy that has showed up uh, with some wood uh with oh you mean wig guy wig guy with this huge hair uh some kind of you said it was an enlarged uh, donald trump uh, thing going on there on the top yeah. of the side it's almost floating above his head and he has a mm. cigarette hanging from his lip oh it's like uh, his hair is like a halo a halo of hair halo hair or so. wig guy. Anyway, he is sort of like a caretaker there. And he... Um, he's uh, woodman. He, he's, he's a woodman as well. He brings wood to this uh, place. And he tells this uh, young couple about uh, Dr. Johannes. Uh, and that he has stayed behind in these mountains. Uh, trying to bring back his wife from this ravine that she fell down into. Uh, he wants to bring back the body, but uh, he can't do it. It's too dangerous, and he needs uh, assistance from at least uh, one other person. And apparently everybody's douchebags, because he hasn't got any uh, assistance, <laughs> I guess. And so Short Pants, uh, well, he feels like... Well, essentially, finally, he finds out that Le- Riefenstahl is like mad about this dude... And that he should um, help him out so he can get out of their life or something like that. No, he, he wants to achieve something as well. <laughs> he says oh yeah, that's what note. he says in the note that he leaves behind to Riefenstahl. I want to achieve something. So... Yeah. Oh yeah, have we yeah. talked about uh, his uh, knitted cap? I this, was just uh, going to bring it up. You read my mind. Who <laughs> are you? Mr. Diesel wears this knitted, almost Playmobil helmet thingy <laughs> going on. And it is it is awesome. Yeah, it's uh, uh, one of the best things in the movie, actually. I'm going to need me one of those. Cap. Yeah, it's great. So uh, It, uh, it engulfs uh, his uh, head almost as good as a jaws... Uh, sized hand can. <clears throat> it looks a, a bit like a one of those bathing caps as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, they eventually <laughs> leave the cabin, and when they do that, we are we end uh, this uh, Pab's director's uh, part of the movie. He essentially the interiors. Directed, 
Yeah, he, he essentially directed the interiors when they're in this cabin and have this sort of... Uh, it's an odd uh, cham- cham- yeah. chamber play thing going on between these three characters. It's an odd chamber play. I said, the, uh, during we, the watch, I said, uh, there's not exactly tension going on, but there is something going on. And that mm. just evaporates uh, when they get out in the exteriors. And while there are incredible uh, shots here... Uh, very m- many uh, incredible shots. There is absolutely nothing going on, as you said. The, <laughs> yeah. the, the drama just is uh, I mean, gone. I mean, you sure you can you can do some great composition. You can uh, you could place props in a very interesting manner. You can find great camera angles. You can do all that, and you can have actors be positioned in. Uh, in a very nice manner but when there is absolutely nothing going on uh, you wonder (laughs) why do all that? I think they just left all the themes in the cabin and went out and then pretty soon they are stuck on a cliff or something so they are essentially back in a chamber piece so they just switch the cabin for a cliff and sit around uh, there but without the the intriguing, uh, eventually, sexual symbolism that was uh, at least uh, fun for me. <laughs> I don't know. There's nothing tying it to be- together. I, I thought the best part in the cabin was when uh, Diesel uh, decided that he hated icicles <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, picked up his, um, his pickaxe and went down and uh, cut down the icicle uh, outside uh, of the house. Uh, he just got mad uh, because that icicle reminded him of the exact same icicle he stared at when his uh, wife uh, fell down the ravine. Yeah, I think especially it's the sound from the dripping icicles yeah. that that gets him going. Drip, drip, drip. Uh, they really didn't get. Uh, dressed for this uh, occasion either. I guess it's some kind of yeah. fashion statement because uh, short pants and uh, uh, Playmobil helmet guy are uh, pretty dapper. It's very weird when Diesel um, he comes clean and tells uh, Lenny Riefenstahl about his wife and uh, it, there's a flashback uh, and he talks... Um, uh, over the flashback uh, about some images when he tried to go down the ravine to collect uh, her and he could still hear her screams down there uh, but he couldn't get down all the way um, and so there's an intertitle that sort of says like uh, but all that was left was the subglacial stream that roared in the dark and I was like did he really say that? It's poetic. That seems that seems way too poetic for a guy mourning. No, but when he's wife. writing in his journal, he he ends it with alone. Oh yeah, and just closes <laughs> it dramatically and stares. Yeah, and 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 he has been uh, has been staring at the couple uh, <laughs> Riefenstahl and uh, short pants. Oogling them. And they're they're like um, embracing each other and being cuddly and cute. And he's like, oh. <clears throat> and he writes, alone. So anyway, there's there's a gang of other people showing up, which leads to the doll action. We have no idea who they are, but they are great dolls falling down the ice. And uh, then you just sit in anticipation for more doll action, but we won't get any. Uh, so after three days on this cliff, SpongeBob <laughs> Short Pants just shoves his head in a crevice in the ice and goes insane. So then, and <laughs> there's this rescue party out, and they have the most impressive imagery going on. They have these torches, and they are climbing down ravines and climbing through ice and they are backlit so they are just silhouettes uh, and it's this stark very uh, dynamic uh, 
images. So I, I can I can just watch this while I wonder why a bit, but it's it's fascinating enough. But then it comes the the kill <laughs> bus kill for me. There's a plane circling for 15 minutes. It's uh, punishing. Uh, yeah. There's nothing yeah, going there's on a, here. There's a guy. There's a guy that uh, that is uh, delivering some kind of message to the people stuck on this uh, cliff, this ravine. Um, but the thing is, he's he he goes by their cliff like twenty times, and he drops small parachutes with the with a message tube, and he does this in every flyby. And we were like, how many parachute uh, messages does he have in his very small airplane? Um, And this comes after 10 minutes of the plane just flying uh, from one side to another with these... uh, I mean, while the images are good, the camera movements here with, uh, I suppose, frozen fingers are very (laughs) not good. Yeah, they're very fidgety. uh, And not at all like the smooth pan we had in Steamboat (laughs) Bill Jr. Uh, So uh, there should be an intertext here. 20 drops later or something. Yeah. Yeah, and then they get rescued and the movie is over. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of architecture going on um, <laughs> in the shots uh, with the, the 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 search party and the torches and their positioned in very um, fantastic ways uh, yeah. over these glaciers and the mountain tops and uh, in the in the darkness uh, with uh, only these torch bearers the lighting. Um, the the screen it's uh, fantastic uh, shots and the shot the shot the camera that follows uh, a climber down a tight ravine mm. I don't even know how they did that that's a camera move that is uh, great <laughs> so yeah. so I gotta go back a bit on they should just not do pan and tilts but they can yeah. definitely do uh, what they are doing. At that and we get uh, a close-up of a foot, so I'm guessing that's why Tarantino uh, likes this movie. Yeah, and he's in it. <laughs> he's in it as well, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's why he felt the need to reference this in Inglorious Bastards. But, uh, for, for, a, for a time, I, I thought it was really refreshing with all these close-ups. There are very many tight close-ups on faces and Mm. you and i haven't seen that that much uh no i mean comedies that we're watching in these comedy movies as the chaplin quote goes i mean you 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 shot everything in in full uh, full screen uh, in long shots so to capture all of the action and you almost never go into the faces um so yeah it's uh, it's very it's very nice to actually get to uh, investigate a human face. Uh, only though they're clean shaven and quite boring, so mm, I don't know. It's really fun that you can uh, sort of reprogram. So uh, we have watched so many movies uh, and now uh, a close up feels uh, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is that is weird. Um, so yeah, I wonder what uh, what what more things we will feel is refreshing when going into the thirties. Um, time will tell, um, and uh, I'm guessing you guys listening will get to find out as well if you keep listening to Pod Hard. Thank you.